I want to start out this video by telling you a quick story. Okay. So there was a 70 year old man a while back who went to the doctor to have hernia surgery. He had already fathered four children throughout his life and identified as a male for his whole life. But when the doctors opened him up for surgery, they found a uterus. All right, so that's a bit of a shocking story, but it's a great illustration of how sex determination isn't nearly as simple as we think it is. This is very true, but continue. You see, sex and gender are two different things, but sex is also more like a spectrum than a binary. <sighs> oh boy, here we go. Unfortunately, in talking about gender, we often say that someone's sex is male or female, but their gender identity can differ from that. But that's wrong. Sex isn't as simple as male or female, and the idea of a biological sex is often used to undermine the validity of transgender people's identities. I'll agree with that. If someone is adamantly against transgender people, side note, I mean actual transgender people who have gender dysphoria, People often refer to their biological sex and say, this is how you are, these are your chromosomes, you can't change that. Like, no shit Sherlock, I'm pretty sure everyone who has had a sex reassignment surgery knows they can't change their genetics. But back to the video. So let's start out with what do you mean by male or female? Do you mean having XX chromosomes or XY chromosomes? Because actually, most people never have their chromosomes tested. For example, there was a case of a 46 year old woman who had already had two healthy children and she went to the doctor and discovered that she had both XX and XY cells in her body. Doctors believe that she had an intersex condition called chimerism, resulting from twins in her mother's womb merging to make her. If your definition of male and female is strictly chromosomal, then you would have to say she's male and female and yet able to get pregnant and give birth to children. Again, I agree with this, because as you stated, sex determination is complicated, and though sex chromosomes do technically determine our biological sex, our DNA is far from perfect, and things can go wrong. So I agree that chromosomes per se shouldn't necessarily be the definitive identifier for sex. However, what you just described is a genetic condition that, from what you've told us, did not affect this woman's phenotype, physiology, or anatomy. So yes, she is still a female. These kinds of conditions, when someone doesn't fit strictly into what we imagine as male or female, is called being intersex. Now you might be asking yourself, well, how common is it to be intersex? Couldn't this just be some kind of disorder that affects a very small number of people? Well, no. At the moment, estimates for how many people have some form of intersex condition range from 0.05% to 1.7% of the population. In the United States alone, that's somewhere between 160,000 and 5.4 million people. Ooh, you are very sneaky with your wording there, I must say. If you listen back, Wiley said that affects a small number of people, rather than a small percentage of people, which can be misleading and encourages an emotive rather than a logical response. Riley, that is still a tiny percentage of the population. The number of individuals that you state is still irrelevant when contrasted to the immense number of people without intersex conditions. As for that statistic, that is a very large gap in how many people you say could be intersex in the US. As such, it just doesn't sound accurate or reliable. But those also might be fairly conservative estimates, considering that a lot of people go their entire lives without ever knowing that they had an intersex condition, like the 70 year old and the 46 year old from earlier. Yes, because it does not always affect the physiology or anatomy to the point where someone would notice it or for it to cause any concern. And how our chromosomes work may be more complex than we currently know, since studies have found that parents with XX chromosomes who have given birth to children with XY chromosomes often end up integrating those XY chromosomes into their own bodies. And many people with XY chromosomes grow up with some of their parents' XX chromosomes in their body. That's just one of many factors that can contribute to someone having both XX and XY cells in their body, because our cells aren't 100% exactly the same all the time. But again, you seem to forget that even though this happens, and that someone could have a mixture of chromosomes, it does not affect their physiology, be that hormones or genitalia. God, I feel like I'm a fucking record player on repeat. As a matter of fact, the XX and XY chromosomes weren't even always called sex chromosomes, and there was a lot of debate about calling them that initially because they seemed to not be the end-all be-all of sex determination. I don't think anyone with a basic understanding of biology and physiology would say that only sex chromosomes determine biological sex. However, you cannot deny that they are a huge factor, as our DNA codes for the hormones and proteins that determine our genitalia and the other organs that, in turn, determine our biological sex. But again, our DNA is not perfect and everyone's production level of hormones differ. But our bodies do inevitably produce either male or female, penis or vagina. 
And even besides intersex conditions, of course there are variations. There are biological women that have small breasts. There are biological men with very little body hair as an adult. But that does not make them a different sex, nor does it make them any less of a man or a woman, and it does not make sex a spectrum. There are simply differences between humans due to differences in hormones and their external environment. Ugh, I feel like I'm rambling. Plus, it should be noted that assuming that this is a medical condition that can be fixed is a very dangerous way of thinking. Just think about how mainstream society used to believe that homosexuality was a disorder that could be fixed. We now know that corrective therapy for queer people is extremely damaging, and there's rising evidence that the same could be said for corrective surgery on intersex individuals. Just a small point, because I will agree with you on this to an extent later, but there is a big difference between a simple attraction, which is entirely mental, versus being intersex, which is a physical condition that you seem to either be ignorant of or simply refuse to acknowledge it, can cause problems and medical issues. But I'll get onto that soon. Lots of intersex babies with unclear genitalia undergo surgery that they obviously can't consent to to make them conform to either male or female standards. This is a terrible, terrible practice that's still going on in the United States and elsewhere in the world. <laughs> See, my heart wants to agree with you on this one. In an ideal world, somebody born with both sets of genitalia should be able to grow up and decide for themselves which genitalia they want to have, if they want to get rid of one at all. But this in itself can also be dangerous. One such situation is androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS. In this instance, infants are born with externally normal female genitalia, but have internal testes. Not removing these internal testes can be dangerous, as they can become cancerous. Even the Intersex Society of North America acknowledges this medical finding and advise this procedure themselves, though they do advocate that physicians should wait until the child is older so they can decide for themselves. And this is just my own opinion being thrown in here now, but before, you stated yourself that it is impossible for intersex people to have two functioning sets of genitalia, that is, that both sets can produce viable offspring. And from what I've found, it's usually pretty obvious which set is non-functional. So would it not be logical to remove the non-functional one in case that child wanted to have children in the future, among other things? I don't know, again, just my two cents. Biologists who study sex determination agree across the board that sex is a spectrum and that making people check male or female on a box is reductive and inaccurate. Can... can I have a citation for that, please? What do you judge their sex on? Chromosomes? Cells? Anatomy? Genitalia? Hormones? Outward physical appearance? And what if all of those don't line up? But they almost always do, Riley. Anatomy, genitalia, hormones, and outward physical appearance are all connected within biology. Chromosomes determine hormones. Hormones determine genitalia as well as outward physical appearance, which makes up someone's anatomy. Of course, they don't always line up, that's true. But 99% of the time, they produce either male or female. Saying otherwise is just intellectually dishonest. Intersex conditions can affect any number of these things. They can have XY chromosomes, but have external female genitalia. They can have XX chromosomes, but have testes. They can have combinations of chromosomes, or they can exhibit some male sex characteristics and some female characteristics. As I said, DNA is imperfect. You are conflating outliers with the norm. Carry on. And even for those people who seem to fall completely into our definitions of male or female, there really isn't as much variation as we like to believe. Sexual dimorphism is the name for sex differences within a species, and some species have massive sexual dimorphism to the point where one sex is twice as big as the other sex. But within humans, we actually have a very low amount of sexual dimorphism. This means that there's quite a lot of overlap between males and females. For instance, while males tend to be taller, there are plenty of females who are taller than males. It's just illogical to look at humans as a species and think that the two sexes have a clear line between them, because they really don't. True, we don't have as much sexual dimorphism as, say, spiders, but sexual dimorphism is not purely to do with size, but general physical appearance. Bearing this in mind, there are still distinct differences between the sexes, some of the biggest ones being muscle and fat deposition. For women to gain as much muscle as a man, they have to work much, much harder, hence why we have separate categories for men and women's sports. And women have greater fat deposition, particularly in their hips and bust, giving them the distinctive curves which is very difficult for men to obtain. 
It's true, there are masculine looking women and feminine looking men. There's not a clear line. But in the general populace, if you look at humans as a species, there are differences between the sexes. You cannot deny that. And you might say, what about the ability to make babies? But the fact of the matter is that not all male or female people are capable of having babies. Some people are infertile, and some people have hysterectomies or vasectomies. You can't even place people in a box based on their ability to have kids. Finally, this is actually something I'll agree with you on in the context of transgenderism at least. I always found it stupid trying to bash transgender people by saying, well you can't have kids, you're infertile. And I'm just sitting here like, well, my mum made herself infertile after she had me, so... <laughs> However, in the context of biological sex, I think this point is sort of irrelevant. I don't believe anyone, except maybe doctors who have reasons for doing so, has ever tried to categorise people based on their ability to have children. And that's the end of the points I'm going to respond to in this video. Okay, so if anyone is still watching this, this is actually a preface to another video I'm going to make responding to a different video of Riley's, but they keep referring so much to this previous video, I thought I'll just make a response to this one first, then make another one responding to the video I actually want to respond to. And I know Riley has been responded to almost to death, but unlike a lot of people with the same viewpoints, Riley, in particular, seems to actively encourage discussion and debate on these topics, so I was actually quite keen to put my two cents in on the issue. So, stay tuned for the next video, where I will take on Riley once again. Turtle out.